We are continuing on and looking at Ephesians chapter 4. We uh, are having a slightly abbreviated service today so that the wedding can happen at 11 o'clock. So if you're watching your watch, you know how much time there is left. Everybody did so well that I have almost my full time right now. So we're looking at Ephesians chapter 4. Paul started off by talking about him being a prisoner of the Lord and walking in a manner of worthy. worthy. Then we talked about how we need to respond to each other in humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love. And we want to be eager to maintain, and that included passion as well as diligence, the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And that brings us to chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. And what is interesting in these short verses that we're going to read, it's really a, pre, a brief presentation of nearly everything we believe in. In just these four or three verses, uh, the, the basics of the gospel are in these verses, and it's foundational. In fact, some would say this is a short, systematic theology, and that is a very big word that just means looking at individual components of what we believe as part of a whole system. And Paul says this, and just these seven things, it's, it's going to really outline what we believe. He says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope. And the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Paul here says there are seven individual one element things. One things. For some reason, I don't know about you, but sometimes I like to make things complex for myself. Don't you? It seems like I'll have a task list for the day of three items and I get to the end of the day and none of them have happened because other things got in the way and things are just complex at times. We, we enjoy that complexity and we even brag about it, don't we? Don't you? How's your day going? Oh, I've just got so much on my plate today. Well, there's only three items, but that's still a lot, especially when you don't complete any of them by the end of the day. But we tend to make things complex at times. In these verses, Paul narrows everything down to basically saying, understand these seven things. And if we can understand these seven simple things, well, they're not too simple in the end. They're pretty complex. In fact, their interaction between at least three of them are some, one of the most complex things in Scripture that I don't fully even understand. But if we can narrow it down to these seven things, it lays out the basics of what we should believe. These short verses take us through the foundation steps of our Christian walk. We've talked about uh, already what we're going to be looking at next year, and one of the topics came up. Do you remember foundations class that used to be taught here at Starville? It was taught here for about 35 years, and it's in a set of notes now that uh, are being used with young children as well as classes that are taught in many other parts of the world from that foundation class that Pastor Dad originally wrote. Well, these seven things are part of those foundations. Part of those foundations. So let's keep it simple. That first one, Paul says, is there is one body. One body. In Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individual members, one of an another. We are the body of Christ. Now look around this morning. 
Everybody sort of looks different, don't they? Can you identify the hand or the ears? Don't identify the toes. All right. But we're all made differently, aren't we? And yet the Lord has called us all together for a purpose. He's called us to function as one body. And if one member of our body isn't working well in our body, the whole body hurts, doesn't it? And that's true in the church. It's true here at Starville Church, but it's true in the church at large as well. We're one body. When uh, everyone got home from Romania that went on the trip recently, it was so encouraging for me to hear some of the testimonies. And one of those testimonies said, maybe several of them even, that, well, we could just identify with the people in Romania so quickly. It was obvious we were part of the same body. And we are the body of Christ. When I was, well, when our girls were young, we had a record. And I've sang this record before, and I'm going to do it again because I used to sing it all the time. And the song went like this. We are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Together bringing his love to the world. Do any of you remember that song? Val does. (laughs) But it's true. We are his body. And we're to function as that. We all have a place. We all have a purpose. That's true here at Starville but it's true in the greater body of Christ as well. Different churches have different purposes. We as a church have a kind of focused purpose on missions, on being involved in missions. Other churches, less so, but they focus on other things. Some of them focus on evangelism. Some of them focus on uh, education and so forth. The Lord's given us a missions call. And so we want to function in the purpose that he's made us, but we are all one body, nonetheless, one body. Second, Paul says this, there is one body and one spirit. One spirit. That word spirit literally means breath of life. The breath of life. I can remember a number of years ago when I was in college, I had a professor that at the beginning of class said, what's the most important thing in life you do? And we were all very idealistic and we came up with these big goals of accomplishments that had to happen. And he just nodded and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And finally we came to the point, well, what's your answer? And he said, oh, breathe. What do you mean? That's not very spiritual. This was at a Christian college. What do you mean breathe? He said, well, if I don't breathe, I can't do anything else. So that's the most important thing. (laughs) But that concept of the breath of life being in us, if the Holy Spirit is not there, we really can't do anything else of value, can we? His life is there for us. In John 14, 25 and 26, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit was going to be sent for us to take care of the other issues. So if we can breathe in the Spirit... I don't just say that in a natural way, but in a spiritual way for all of us. If we're breathing in the Holy Spirit, in communion with him, he's going to take care of the other issues. So maybe the list is actually only one thing today. Breathing in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit works through his people today. In 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11, it talks about the gifts, the gifts to, in verse 7, it says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. In other words, the Lord has revealed the Holy Spirit in one sense to you in a unique way that he hasn't to me because I need you. But he's also revealed the Holy Spirit to me in a certain way that you don't have and you need me. And only the power of the Holy Spirit can bring us together that we're able to communicate And we're able to get everything that we need. For to one is given through the Spirit, 
the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one, the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. There's one body, there's one spirit. Next, Paul goes on to say there is one hope, one hope, or one expectation. 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and of Jesus Christ, our hope. Now, I have to be honest, over the last six to nine to twelve months, the Lord has been dealing with me on this issue of hope. You know why? Because I've had it wrong. And I think it's an easy one for us to have wrong. What is the hope that's mentioned in this verse? Jesus Christ is the hope. But haven't you found, at least sometimes, your hope not being on Jesus Christ, but what you want Jesus Christ to do for you. Or what maybe you think he's going to do for you. And if our hope's on the wrong thing, if our hope's on what he does and not him, or what we want him to do and not him, or even what we think he should do and not him, our hope is on the wrong thing. And I found myself in that predicament because I've hoped certain things will happen and I've felt inspired about it. Get that tingly feeling. Kind of that feeling you get when your team scores a touchdown. It's like, woo! But that doesn't make it real, does it? Our hope has to be on Jesus, on him. Because what he decides to do, where he decides to lead, what he decides is going to happen next, if our hope's on that, then it's stable. If our hope is on, well, I really hope the Lord will do this. And I still hope the Lord will do certain things. But if my hope is on that, I'm going to be disappointed. My wife at one time hoped she would get the perfect husband. She's lost that hope now. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? We, we tend, and I, I felt the Lord dealing with this issue specifically, I'm hoping on the wrong things. Our hope has to be in Christ Jesus, in him alone. What he does, he's going to do. Now, I want, I'm going to pray for stuff. That's not going to stop me. I'm going to pray for healing. I'm going to pray that the Lord will move, that he'll do certain things. But my hope can't be in those things. It's got to be in him. Our hope must be in Christ Jesus. Number four, there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one Lord. Now that word Lord, we don't use very much ourselves, unless you were watching the coronation a little bit over the last couple days, you may have heard that term Lord used. It really just means master. Yes, me Lord. Master or boss. We would say in some ways, yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, in its place in our cultural context today. But Lord means master. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name, so at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus Christ is Lord. 
that means he's master. It's easy to say Lord. It's easy to say boss. But it's a little more difficult to follow through with obedience, isn't it? Isn't it for you? Have you ever worked for someone and say, yeah, yeah, I'll take care of that. Two weeks later, yeah, yeah, I'll take care of that. I, I saw a t-shirt recently that said, um, you don't, I will do what I said I will do around the house. It was talking husband and wives, the husband getting things done. You, and then underneath it said, you don't have to remind me every six months. <laughs> that's certainly not a lord relationship is it <laughs> but one of declaring him lord where he is master and him being master means there can't be other masters in our lives we are going to serve someone aren't we or something uh you have to serve something in Matthew 6, 24, it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. And that word hate doesn't mean hate in the way we understand it. It means love it less. Okay? Or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Then he goes on to say, you can't serve God and money. You can't serve two things at the same time. You can't even serve two people at the same time, can you? We have this idea of multitasking, thinking, oh, I can get it all done. I can serve everybody. Uh, it's not going to happen. Is he Lord? Is he Lord? If he is Lord, that means he's in control. And who did it say was Lord in this? Jesus is Lord. He is Master. Now, if he is Master, that means... Yes, sir. But it also means it's immediately done. It's taken care of. And I find, for me, it's easy to agree with my master talking to him and then walking away. It's less easy as time goes on. You know, after lunch, after Friday, when I retire... But he's calling us to follow him day by day, that he's master here and now in those small life decisions. Paul continues on. There is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith. One faith. That word faith carries the concept of having a deep moral conviction about something. Ephesians chapter 4, 13, it says, Until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And that concept of faith actually attained to the unity of the faith, and I think everything else behind it partly defines it. Faith is actually moving us to the fullness of Christ. It's the whole story. It's not just that I believe Jesus existed. Most history books believe that. It's not just believing that God is. We were told in the New Testament that even the demons and devils believe that God is. So it's something more than that. It's a deep moral conviction about who he is and my relationship with him. That connection with him. That going beyond, that leading to the stature of the fullness of Christ. That until I can be alongside of him, there's still a journey in front of us. It's also this concept that there's only one way to him. And that's through Jesus Christ. John chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do not know. You do know him and have seen him. Knowing him, 
is actually what faith is all about. And it's knowing him all the way to being the fullness of him, that he is moving and, and moving through us. Next one. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One baptism. And that word baptism comes from a Greek word that basically means to be covered over or completely immersed, to be dunked into something. Uh, it, it, it's used a lot of different ways in Greek culture, but they used it in the dyeing of cloth, that when they put a cloth in a dye, they would completely cover it. In other words, it wasn't like a tie-dye thing where you just hit it with a few spots or splash it. They completely dunked it under. There is one baptism. And i just like to relate that to this. There's a salvation experience that the Lord wants and requires all of us to go through. But it's actually a process, isn't it? You know, in uh, medieval times, right before men went off into battle, they would baptize them. And many of the nobility were known when they went into the waters of baptism to be dunked, they would hold their sword above the water without their hand being dunked. In other words, they were committing everything except what's in my hand to destroy somebody else with. And they wouldn't completely get baptized. Not everything was sanctified. There's one baptism, and it's got to be all of us, doesn't it? It has to be the whole thing. We can't leave something out of the water. We've got to be completely covered by His grace, by His blood, has to completely cover us. Finally, there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Behold, we... Beloved, we are God's children now. And we will be, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because he because we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. There is one God, and we are his children. I have a great experience today. My whole family's here. Usually when I met my whole family, I meant me and two generations above me. Now it's me and two generations below me. Not sure how I got to the, that place in life this fast, but it has. But my grandson's here today. And he kind of looks like his dad. And he kind of looks like his mom. He kind of looks like me. There's some things we look at when we say, well, he looks like Val's dad. They never met. But there is that resemblance that carries through generations. Isn't that true? And our Heavenly Father, it's saying in these verses, the work that he's wanting to do in us right now is so that when we eventually see him, we'll look like him. Not in facial aspects, although maybe some of that even happens too. But that's what's going on in the inside. We can look like him. We can be like him. People will be able to, when they see us, say, oh, you're in the same family. That's your father, isn't it? Yeah, that's my heavenly father. And he's calling us to that type of relationship, that one where he's my dad. I'm like him. So we are his church, and aren't you thankful for that? We are his church called to follow him with hope. Hoping in him, not in other things. And faith, having that deep assurance 
that deep moral conviction, that focus on Him, where He's moving in us, that we will be changed and become to come to full maturity in Him. Being baptized in His name, totally immersed in His purposes, in His calling. Because He is Spirit. He is Lord. And He is our Heavenly Father. Those three, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, come together in this verse. A, a picture of the Trinity. And we're not even going to talk about that because we want it simple today. But these seven things, if we can get these right, I believe the Lord can lead us through all the rest. In fact, he said he can lead us through all truth. Let's stand together this morning. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Say, Lord, we come to you today. Lord, we're thankful. Lord, we want to respond to you even this morning. These are seven things, and by themselves, they're, they're rather, rather simple and basic. But Lord, we want these to be strong foundational issues in our heart. Lord, if we can get these right, I believe you can build on us. You can grow us and you can change us. But wrong concepts in any of these seven things... Lord, they, well, they prevent us from really knowing you. And in the end, we want to know you. So, Lord, just as we're going to pause here in a minute, I just ask that you would speak to each of our hearts today how these seven things need to touch us individually, how we want to respond to you and what you're saying. So we're just going to pause quietly for a minute so that the Lord can speak to our hearts. Lord, you are our hope. So we look to you. Lord, we want you to be Lord of all, of, of me, of us. Lord, that, that phrase that's in a song, if you're not Lord of everything, then you're not Lord at all, is so true. And we want you to be Lord of our lives, to rule and reign in us. Lord, we're Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you sent your Son for us. And Lord Jesus, you came, you suffered, you died, and you rose again for us to cleanse us from our sins. You sent your Holy Spirit to dwell with us. And Holy Spirit, I know that you're moving in our hearts today. Lord, would you just speak to us through this week that we would respond to you, that faith would arise in a new way. Lord, that we would be able to be totally immersed in your purposes. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can stand.